I'm still picking up on that clicking. Okay. Alright, so, uh, welcome back to another week. So, let's see, where are we at? Mm, we're on week 13. So, some reminders you guys have your uh, quiz 12, which is social psychology, due this week. Um, along with the discussions for that. So we're up to chapter 12 now. Um, exam 3 is also due this week. It was released last uh, Wednesday or so. Um, so just get that done before we work up to the final. Um, suggested deadline is this Wednesday, but as long as you get it done uh, sooner rather than later. Covers chapters 9 through 12. And then we'll be getting into disorders and treatment. Uh, so for the next chapters, uh, for Disorders in Treatment 15 and 16, um, yeah, I usually just cover both of them together. So I talk about disorders and I talk about treatment because it's just, just the way it goes. Um, because when you start talking about disorders, people ask like, well, what can I do if I have that disorder? So I just talk about treatment um, all together with it. <laughs> So without further ado, this is one of the subjects I really like to do, and I especially like to do it in person with the students and stuff, um, get you guys to share your personal experiences with these various disorders and the questions that you guys have with them. But given the circumstances, we're stuck with me just talking to you about these uh, disorders, which um, hasn't been something I've done before, so this will be interesting to just kind of go through it and see how it goes. Alright, so uh, we take normal for granted because uh, when we talk about disorders, we think of normality, right? We think of what's considered normal, and normal is what everyone else uh, experiences. So the majority of people have this experience, and then we consider this experience normal. But normal is a subjective term, right? It's what we consider it as normal. So we talk about stuff like the new normal, right? So right now, coronavirus. Uh, what is normal? Um, everyone's always thinking, saying like, well, because of coronavirus, everything's upturned. Nothing's really normal anymore, right? So um, anxiety, for example, right? Right now, people's anxieties are pretty high. Is that considered the new normal now that we are anxious or we're restless or people are getting cabin fever? Um, you can see how this alters our normal, our circumstances of what's considered normal uh, given the environment. So it's very subjective. It's very... Uh, based on the time, right, the circumstances you're in, it's this whole big old um, thing like culture would be a big influence on what's normal, right? So because we try to decide what's normal, we consider everything outside of that abnormal. For example, uh, at one time, um, homosexuality was considered a psychological disorder. Uh, it's like gender dysphoria, I think was the classification. Um, but that's not considered correct anymore. So like homosexuality is not a psychological disorder anymore. Um, but before when everyone, we, we thought everyone's sexuality was supposed to be heterosexual, heteronormative, um, we considered people who deviated from that abnormal. So you get that abnormality. So both of these are subjective terms and it could change from time to time. Um, and the earlier concepts of what we are used to think of disorders as being like weird or abnormal or the exception and we're starting to understand that mental disorders psychological disorders are actually more common than we think and it would be even more common if people were to you know accept it as a everyday health issues rather than like this odd thing that you go to get checked up for i always argue for like how we have these uh, medical checkups right 
So you get medical checkups every year, maybe shorter than that, every six months or so um, about your health. But there's no mental checkup. So the regular uh, expectation, what should be the new normal, is that we get these regular mental health checkups, like every year or shorter, depending on how your mental health is, for you to come in and just be like, hey, how you're doing? Because you know, most of the times uh, everyone has a little bit of uh, these issues. All right, um, yeah, so it's hard to imagine a world where you can no longer trust what your perceptions are. So we also take our perceptions for granted as well because, you know, we see things that are there, we hear things that are there, and most of us assume that what we see and what we hear is pretty much the same as what everyone else sees and hears. Um, but for some of us, that might not be true. So if you have a, a mental disorder, um, your what you see and what you hear is slightly different. Uh, for example, anxiety, right? If you have social anxiety, as you walk into a classroom, what you pay attention to, uh, what you try to ignore and all that, it's gonna be different from the person who's next to you who doesn't have any of those issues. Or if you have depression, right? So if you have depression, um, you may be looking at things, you'll be focusing on the sad scenes of a movie more, for example, or just like letting those uh, sad songs dwell on your mind or those uh, thoughts more or bad things that happen to you kind of stick with you longer. So these little alterations in our perceptions, right? And it's hard to imagine the world uh, you see is not what everyone else sees. Uh, so again, we take this for granted. Um, but if you suffer from schizophrenia, for example, um, the world looks it could look very different when you depending on the severity right i had a friend who um, did too many drugs um and he used to tell me about like hey do you get these like burnouts or these i don't know burn images in your eyes and i was like what and he was like yeah sometimes when like a light goes past me uh, it leaves a trail so it's just a burn trail across his vision like if a red light passes by him he just has this red trail across his vision and i was like yeah, man, you got to stop doing all these drugs. Um, but yeah, just he starts seeing uh, his he does end up developing schizophrenia. Um, I would say it's drug induced because he just did too many drugs for too long. Um, then he started to uh, have all these other issues. And one of that was like he became schizophrenic. So it's hard to wake up from a dream that it's your reality. So um, we have this idea that or we have this wrong idea that people think mental health is like a choice. Uh, people pick it because uh, they want attention or they want to li live in a world that is more exciting than the world they are in. Um, but all that is uh, pretty much wrong because people try to snap out of these mental health issues, but it's not that easy. It's not just, you can't just snap out of it and say, hey, I don't want to have anxiety anymore, or I don't want to be depressed anymore. I don't want to have a schizophrenia or bipolar. Oh, wait, let's try and change the slides here. All right, so some ground rules. Uh, I guess we don't need all these ground rules because no one's here. Um, but normally I ask students to be respectful, be open-minded, um, and to reduce stigmatization because um, I've never really had um, any students cross the line in class uh, about being like mean about mental health or something like that. Most students are pretty understanding that mental health is a real thing. Um, and be aware of self-diagnosis, because when you go through these different descriptions, uh, you may start to feel like you have uh, these different disorders. So again, um, if you don't self-diagnose, if you think you fit under some of these disorders, um, go seek a mental health profession. Normally, I tell my students to go check out the counseling center, schedule an appointment and all that, but that's not available right now. Um, there, I heard there have been more virtual online therapies now. Uh, because of the social distancing and all that. Uh, so some of the bad stuff or some stuff people say, um, stop focusing on the bad stuff and just start living. Um, these are all the wrong things you should say to someone if you know they are suffering from a mental health uh, disorder. Uh, you can snap out of it. Everyone feels the same way sometimes. So comparing uh, issues that they have uh, or feelings that they have or emotions that they have uh, with how you're feeling. So uh, we all feel anxious, but not everyone has an anxiety disorder. 
uh, we all feel sad, but not everyone has depression. And it's almost like completely different things. Um, I don't look at it as too much of a, like a spectrum thing. It's just there's a certain break where it becomes like, is this high anxiety or does this become a disorder? And we'll talk about that more. Like what's the difference between having high anxiety and having an anxiety disorder? So we believe in the medical model that uh, these uh, different mental disorders do connect to having a biological foundation. Um, there's changes in the brain chemistry as well as our biology uh, that basically uh, leads to having a mental disorder. Um, so abnormal behavior. So mental illness, um, what we consider as abnormal behavior is things that are deviant. Uh, deviant is defined as what's atypical and culturally unacceptable. Um, so culture has a big deal in what we consider deviant behavior, right? So if you were to see um, someone dancing in feathers um, and, I don't know, saying things that are not coherent to you and dancing in circles, uh, most of us, of us would think, whoa, that's uh, odd, right? That's very strange, right? Uh, normally, I use the example with, hey, if someone walked by in the hallway in feathers and they were dancing and chanting in um, a tongue that you didn't understand, uh, would you think this person is having a mental breakdown or um, some type of break from reality? And most people say, yeah. Um, but what happens if that person then goes down the stairs um, and joins a group of people who are all uh, dressed in feathers and dancing and speaking in an incoherent tongue to you? Then you start to think, well, now you're part of a group, right? So is it deviant anymore, right? Is it part of someone's culture? Um, so at first, the image that comes up into your mind is really odd, right? Uh, but then when you start to understand, like, oh, the context, oh, it's like, you know, a Native American dance, uh, then it becomes culturally acceptable. It doesn't look that odd anymore, right? So maladaptive, does it interfere with effective functioning? So whatever you do, um, whatever be behaviors you have, to what extent is it interfering with your effective functioning? Um, usually I ask the students, um, how long does it take you to get ready? Is 30 minutes okay, right? Some of us takes less than that. Some of us takes five minutes, some 15, some 30, right? An hour, yeah, we're starting to get a stretch there. What if it takes you two hours? Is that maladaptive? For some individuals, no, still not, right? Um, depending on what you count as getting ready time, right? Maybe they're showering, maybe they're um, doing other things, right? What if it becomes more of a stretch? What if it takes you four hours to get ready? Five or six, is that maladaptive? If every day took you five or six hours to get ready, um, then some people will say, yeah, it sounds maladaptive, right? Um, but what if that's part of your job? Right? What if you put on like monster makeup for your job and five or six hours to put on this monster makeup um, is considered normal, right? So this whole, whole, it's very subjective, right? What is considered maladaptive or not? And how much should someone take their time to get ready? Um, you know some people that um, if they don't get ready, if they don't doll themselves up and all that, um, they can't leave the house. Is that maladaptive? So really varies from person to person. So what we consider also is personally distressful. Does the person feel like it is distressful? Now, if a person takes an hour to get ready, but they feel like that's too much time, that's considered personally distressful. If a person takes six hours to get ready and they feel that's perfectly fine, then it's not personally distressful. We also consider, is it disturbing? Does it violate any social norms? Um, and period, time, um, Time periods vary, right, on what is considered social norms. Um, so maybe in the future, people dress up in a certain way. I just think of like Hunger Games, right? And uh, you see those people dressed up in their fancy makeup, fancy clothes and all that stuff. And I was wondering, like, um, right now in society, if we saw someone who dressed like they were in the Hunger Games, we would think that's disturbing. Why are they so, I don't know, outrageously dolled up and colorful and all that? Um, but in the Hunger Games, that's a social norm, right? And is it unjustifiable? Is there any rationality to the way they're dressed? So again, um, if you're dressed up like the Hunger Games, but you're going to a Hunger Games convention, then it's rational, right? Uh, we see a lot of people in Comic-Con, um, comic conventions and all that, and they're dressed up in all sorts of characters, anime, whatever you can think of. Um, and it's not Halloween, see? So Halloween is another event where you're allowed to dress up whatever way you want, and that's justifiable. 
rational. Um, conventions are another one where it's rational. Um, so, you know, it all depends on context, right? All right. So our next one is on how prevalent is psychological disorders? So the statistics say about half of people will experience a disorder at some point in time. That means half of the population. Remember when I talked about normality? Half of the population experiencing um, <coughs> experiencing a disorder at some point in their lives. Um, then it really challenges this idea of abnormal, right? If half of the people experience it, that's a majority, not majority, but you know, right in the middle there, an estimate. So what happens if more than that? What if 75% of people will experience a psychological disorder at some point in time? Then is that a behavior or that experience abnormal? Um, if the majority experiences it, then it no longer becomes abnormal. It would then become abnormal that you don't have uh, a psychological disorder at some point in your life, right? So there you go. It really flips that subjectivity on its uh, head. So a quarter of people will experience a psychological disorder in any given year. That means about one in four. So there's always um, at least one student, usually one in four students, a class of 20. I usually have like four or five students who have a psychological disorder um, in the class. So it's pretty high. Um, Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. And yeah, depression is going to be really skyrocketing up there. Anxiety is going to be up there right now um, because of the social distancing. Uh, people will probably start to feel more depressed. Uh, people are not noticing the depression as much because everyone's staying inside their homes and not interacting with each other. So you might not catch uh, that someone's depressed. You know, it feels almost normal to be depressed uh, given the circumstances. Um, yeah. And 75% of people are not treated, so we don't take care of our mental health as much as we take care of our physical health, right? So some more breakdowns down here. So this is just uh, prevalence during the past year, about 20% uh, suffer from anxiety disorders, 10% from mood disorders like depression. Then you have bipolar, substance um, abuse. And then any disorders is around 26%. Here's some more breakdowns for like males and females, uh, major depression, more females than males, alcohol abuse, more males than females. So we always have to consider like social context. Um, this difference might reflect actually um, self-medicating instead of um, treating your depression. So for guys, um, instead of treating themselves for depression or anxiety, uh, they may self-medicate and that might show up more like an alcohol abuse um, issue. So they're drinking um, the depression or anxiety away. So that's why you see this gender difference. Different fears. Um, females experience more um, specific phobias like spiders, snakes. Social anxiety disorder, about equal. Drug abuse, again, more males. Uh, PTSD, more females. Um, the world's not really a nice place to females. They are always uh, greater at risk of violence and assault. Um, there's been an increase uh, of domestic calls for violence, uh, domestic abuse and all that uh, because of the, not because of it, no, well, yeah, uh, because of the social distancing, uh, staying home more, um, that leads to an increase in their interactions in the family and that leads to an increase in um, just the violence that goes on at home and then, you know, to the calls, there's been a lot more calls like to report uh, domestic abuse. Generalized anxiety, panic disorder, um, we'll talk about panic disorder later, OCD, and then like a milder form of depression. And often with comorbidity, that means usually you have more than one. So depression and anxiety is often a common one that uh, people suffer from, just having both anxiety and depression. Right, theoretical approaches, we like the biological, psychological, and social cultural. We call this the biopsychosocial approach combines all three types. Um, the medical part of it, just that we treat psychological disorders as diseases. Um, we consider that your psychology matters. It's not just a disease, but your past experiences, uh, your emotions and your personality is going to contribute to the pattern of behaviors that we see. Um, the social cultural, how culture has a big influence Uh, 
um, culture has a big influence on how we treat mental health. Uh, some cultures accept mental health more, um, others not so much. <coughs> America is not one of the best ones, uh, best cultures for mental health, but it's not the worst either. But there's other European countries who recognize the importance of mental health uh, more than uh, what America does because we, we pretty much ignore mental health here in the U.S. and it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So college students are actually at greater risk for mental health. College is a uh, pretty stress-inducing environment. Um, college is hard, so when people are like, hey, college is easy, you don't have to work and stuff, college is actually a lot more uh, stressful um, than the general population. So you have all these issues you got to deal with, the work and all that stuff, tests and all that, um, interacting with other people often. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a greater increase in um, students showing up to uh, counseling centers. So 60.1% of students um, show up with like anxiety. Yeah, that's pretty high anxiety. 50% uh, with depression. Um, oh, these are the reasons why students show up. So if they show up, it's a good chance it's anxiety or depression. So here's anxiety. So students are getting more and more anxious or at least showing up more for anxious symptoms at the counseling center. So that might be like, I'm worried about my homework, my exams, my uh, dealing with college, relationships, right? So that's on here, relationship problems, um, family issues, right? Being away from home, um, what your family thinks of you and all that stuff, uh, dealing with families while you're dealing with school, all kinds of things. So counseling center is a great place to um, get all that worked out um, and have someone to talk to. All right, so students under pressure, basically more statistics on students. 48% um, of students, 49% pretty much attended counseling for mental health concerns. So that's a big number of students. So attending the counseling center or having a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, that you see regularly is pretty common. So 50% pretty much, right? Um, on medication, about a third of students been hospitalized for mental health concern, about 10%, so one in 10. Um, for different issues, depression is usually one of the big ones, or having a panic attack. Um, sometimes you, um, people who have a panic attack might feel like they can't breathe, if they think it's a heart attack, and then they maybe, the ambulance may come and hospitalize them for that, but then they find out, oh, it's, when they get there, it's like everything goes back to normal. That's kind of some of the, the patterns of having a panic attack, um, which we'll get into more later. Um, Injury without suicidal intent, so that's self-harm, so 23%, pretty high up there, almost a quarter of students <coughs> engaging in cutting behavior, um, hitting behavior, uh, burning themselves, like with cigarettes, lighters, whatever, um, the hair iron, um, hair pulling, so, or scratching themselves so they bleed, so all kinds of that. Um, seriously, consider attempting suicide, about 30%, that's pretty high, um, we'll get into the suicide rates and risks and all that later, but that's a pretty high rate for suicide. Um, Daniel asked if psychological disorders can resolve themselves and can develop at any age or point in time. Yes, uh, they can resolve themselves depending on the disorder and the cause of that. So um, sometimes they go away if the source of the disorder goes away. Um, sometimes people just have a different viewpoint on it. So it depends on the severity. Um, in, in the more severe cases, it doesn't, it's not really able to resolve itself on its own. Um, like grief, for example, you can have depression um, as a result of losing someone, right? So grief and can cause you to go into a depressive spiral and that can go resolve itself over time, right? And you get over someone's death and you no longer feel that depression. Um, it can also have what we call, we'll, we'll talk about it later too, but like, it can send you into a major depressive or a clinical depression. This is when you completely stop taking care of yourself. Um, so grief can cause you to go co to complete shutdown mode. And that can cause you to be hospitalized because you're no longer eating and all that stuff. Um, that can lead you to ha be more prone to having those episodes in the future. So something else can trigger those episodes. So in the future where you go into complete shutdown mode again. So it could resolve itself if it's... Um, current moment and then like show up again later. Um, we do see that most mental health disorders show up at an early point. So like 
your teen years is when it shows up, but it could manifest itself a lot later as well. Um, and I expect that it's going to increase a lot because of the whole coronavirus thing. Um, it's a scary time for a lot of people. Um, so that can create a lot of uh, disorders like anxiety to basically manifest itself or depression right now um, to manifest itself in a time that normally would take like years later for it to manifest. It might be because of our current environment that it manifests itself earlier rather than uh, later. And then like with schizophrenia, uh, my friend might have had like vulnerabilities to schizophrenia. I'm not sure. He did a lot of uh, a lot of drugs. So his schizophrenia, I'm not sure if it's like a vulnerability or if it's drug induced. Uh, maybe he just did too many drugs and his uh, his brain patterns, his brain chemistry just got stuck um, in that alternate state. So now he's like hallucinating and um, having all these weird thoughts. So. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Considered seriously hurting another person, eleven percent. Uh, injury. So some. Yeah. There, there's, there's been stories of like roommates poisoning their roommates and all that. Yeah. So sometimes that happens in college. All right. Our starting point to talk about mental health is everything starts with what we consider a diagnosis, right? So we gotta figure out what's really going on, um, and the, the diagnosis is only as good as what you kind of tell your, um, your therapist. So um, it's hard, though, because for you to go up to someone like a doctor, uh, a stranger, and basically um, open up your heart and your mind and tell them everything um, that's going on. So, for example, with the counseling center, a lot of students come in there and they start with, um, I'm struggling with my work right now. I can't do my work, right? I'm worried about failing. But when you start to talk more about it, you start to figure out like what's really causing that failure or that lack of motivation. Um, so whenever I see students not doing their work, I don't really think of it as laziness, um, which a lot of professors are like, students are too lazy, they just don't want to do their homework. But a lot of that might be symptoms of depression. Like you're too depressed to um, do your work. So sometimes you kind of have to find like that day when you are uh, less depressed than other days to get that work done. Um, that's why I'm so flexible on my workload because sometimes you have periods of time when you just can't get yourself to do the work. Um, and it's to the point that regardless of the threats that are made, um, you still won't do it. It's like, hey, you're gonna fail the class if you don't turn your work in. Um, and that depression um, still stops them from getting that done. Um, yeah, so a little ahead, but I've had students who uh, show up for their entire semester and um, not get their work done. And then, but they're always in class and volunteering and you, I couldn't tell on the surface that that person was depressed. And then um, after this d disorders lecture, they would, they came up and said, you know what? Um, I've been depressed all semester. Um, even though I'm in your class, I'm not really in your class. Like I'm not there. Um, and then they've told me they uh, will try to snap out of the depression and get their work in. Um, and in some cases, they have been successful <clears throat> in turning their work in. Get some more water. So the diathesis stress model basically illustrates that um, some of us have more vulnerabilities to being triggered and having a mental health uh, disorder than others. So we can experience the same events, um, coronavirus, for example, and that causes a lot of stress. Some of us have a higher vulnerability where we will develop a mental disorder during this time. Some of us have a lower vulnerability where um, even though the stress levels are same, it doesn't overflow um, our natural ability to deal with it. So uh, this is just treatment prevalence. I'll just kind of skim through some of this. Uh, basically, um, we don't get treated for mental health. So only about 20% um, of individuals receive treatment. 45% um, of those with mental health say they don't really need to be treated um, or the disorder is not severe enough. 
So let's see, um, not severe enough right there. Ineffective treatment. Uh, treatment's hard. Um, so with treatment of mental health, is yes, there's a medical component, a drug component to it. Um, but the top therapy is probably the more effective um, form. Um, but sometimes the disease is so severe that you need the medication before you can get to the talk therapy. Um, so treatment can be ineffective if you don't really feel a connection with your therapist. Um, usually I ask students to share their experience um, and even some of the counselors at OCC. So some counselor you're going to work with, some counselors you just don't make a connection with. Um, and that happens. So I wouldn't give up right away. If you talk to someone and you don't feel that connection and it's not working out, um, I would ask to get a different therapist um, and that will work out better. And I think the therapist, if they're a good therapist, they should understand uh, that sometimes they don't click with everybody um, and they should be able to recommend you with someone that they think you might click more with. And so that's important. Just like making friends, you got to pick a therapist uh, that you feel comfortable talking to and that understands you. Uh, can afford treatment. I think this is probably should be higher. Um, maybe it's just underreported. But if you don't have health insurance, um, yeah, treatment for mental health, it's not probably going to be something you consider, right? You're already like struggling with uh, treatment for the medical um, health problem, the physical health problems. Um, the mental health is going to just take a back seat. Uh, different treatment personnel, so I talked about therapists, that's just a broad term, but here's the breakdown. You can have um, anyone that's like a counselor, um, they have a master's degree, so like uh, our counselors at OCC, they can have master's degree, uh, specific training, like marriage and family therapy. These individuals uh, don't treat everything, but they treat um, issues with marriage and family, so having like uh, relationship problems and stuff, they'll talk to you through that. Uh, social workers, so this is really cool, master's degree in social work, um, dealing with the community directly, um, visiting homes and assessing and making recommendations and all that, um, and working with families to deal with their situations. Um, yeah, this is much more involved than the other ones. Uh, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor, so if you are prescribed medication for your mental health, um, it's usually through a psychiatrist. Although um, the medical doctors are trying to take over this, and I think that's a horrible idea, um, because some doctors will prescribe medication for mental health now, um, and they're not psychiatrists. So they don't have the really proper background to prescribe you these medications. So we have a lot of issues with that now, um, with the psychiatrist prescribing some type of medication and the doctor prescribing another type of medication and having all these uh, drug conflicts and things like that. So. Uh, to each their own. So the psychiatrist should be the one that's prescribing it, not your medical doctor. But sometimes they will try to give you that stuff. Um, yeah, be wary if your doctor is the one that's trying to um, peddle you some pills instead of a psychiatrist. Um, the usual going is you go see a psychologist. So you go see a psychologist, they diagnose you, and they may recommend you to a psychiatrist a referral so that you can get medication for it. But most of your therapy, your talk therapy, is going to go through the psychologist that you originally um, talked to. Um, so um, it's like the psychologist writes notes up and the psychiatrist uh, follows the psychologist's recommendation. <coughs> All right, history of treatment. Um, Briefly, we started we started from just ignoring and abusing people who had a mental health uh, to moving them to asylums because you know as the uh, rate of people having a mental disorder went up, they needed to put everyone somewhere, um, and basically they just kind of left them there to rot. Um, basically, if you have a mental health uh, disorder, people just ignored you, and then they started to be more humanitarian, um, and they moved to better conditions. Um, like here, <clears throat> it's still almost like a gel, you can see. Um, this is from one flu over the cuckoo's nest, but basically um, these individuals are kept um, in a mental institution um, without a means to really get out. So it's almost like gel, but for mental health. Uh, mental hospitals are the new um, normal. Um, it used to be we have these mental institutions, insane asylums, um, bad, not politically correct, but that's what we used to have. 
Um, and the, these institutions um, were basically shut down because they had a very negative uh, connotation with them. So now you have more of these mental hospitals, right? And so you have different floors, like a mental ward um, at on a certain floor. And you can see that that floor is definitely different from the other floors in the hospital. There's more like security. So it's kind of like uh, just a whole floor that's focused on mental health. Um, then there was a modern movement of deinstitutionalization. So basically it was a really bad movement in the 1960s. Uh, the idea was like, we need to take people out of mental health, uh, mental institutions, insane asylums and all that because they're not getting the right treatment. And they they were really not getting any better if you isolated a bunch of individuals together who are all suffering from mental health. And the idea was that we need to reintegrate them back into society. Um, but it was basically just the government didn't want to really continue paying for taking care of all these individuals with mental health. Uh, they were saying like, hey, we got to close down this institution and open up like clinics. Um, so these people would reintegrate into society, it would cost less and all that. Um, but they never really opened up those clinics. So they just sh shut down these institutions and people with mental health had nowhere to go. And so that's why we have a lot of homeless uh, people on the street with a mental health uh, issue. And this was especially prevalent in um, California, UCLA, where I grew up, uh, did my undergrad. Um, we did have a lot of homeless people who suffered from schizophrenia. Um, early treatments with mental health were really not effective. It had to do with a lot of water, um, showers, wrapping you in a blanket, giving you a continuous bath, giving you a sauna, sunbathing, insulin therapy, and lobotomies. We all know these to not be really effective. Lobotomies were effective in the sense that um, if you were suffering from hallucinations, compulsions, the devil telling you to do things, violence, and all that, they just removed part of your brains. Um, it was effective in that they removed too much brain and then you basically did nothing besides stare out the window. Yeah, you weren't really functioning anymore, but at least the hallucinations went away. Um, JF Kennedy, JFK's uh, sister underwent a lobotomy and that's pretty much what happened to her, if you guys want to look through that. Um, psychoanalysis with Freud is still the standard, the psychodynamic approach. Um, the whole idea of exploring your childhood events, because a lot of things that happen to us in childhood continues to shape our thoughts and behaviors, especially if they were bad things that can lead to a lot of psychological problems as an adult. So psychoanalysis um, basically tries to break down um, what's really going on, right? If you tell me a story about what's going on, um, I have to figure out what your defense mechanisms, what are you lying about kind of thing, or what are you not really telling me the truth about, and if we can... Uh, you know, peel back the layers and all that, we can really get to the, the things that really matter. So that's kind of how psychoanalysis works. Um, but it does take a long time, three to six years. So here's just a breakdown of different therapies, but we have behavioral therapies, cognitive therapies, the humanistic one is still rising, but it's not that popular. A combination is the most common, uh, and psychodynamic is still pretty common on there. So about two thirds of therapy you can say still uses that traditional method of talking through, um, trying to figure out what is really underlying all the issues that you're presenting with. All right, um, our first set of disorders. Anxiety disorders. So these are the different symptoms with anxiety disorders. Um, as well as physical symptoms with anxiety disorders. Uh, some people don't recognize anxiety as a physical symptom, so they might not understand that they have trouble sleeping or hot flashes, and they think it's just like, oh, something's wrong with my body, um, or sweating or trembling, and not think of it as uh, symptoms of anxiety. So sometimes you don't have the mental uh, awareness that you're experiencing anxiety, and you just kind of have the physical symptoms, racing heart, for example, faintness. So... Uh, everyone experiences anxiety, but not everyone has an anxiety disorder. So there's a lot of videos to help you guys through these different symptoms. The first one being here uh, for generalized anxiety disorder. But basically, uh, the idea is that with generalized anxiety disorder, you have all these symptoms, restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, sleep disturbance, muscle tension, um, and you can see the diagnosis here. It says at least three of the following six symptoms, sorry, um, for the past six months. 
And if you think about it, you probably have at least three of these symptoms for the past six months uh, due to college. So college can lead you to feel restless, fatigue, can't concentrate, irritable, can't sleep, right? <clears throat> so do you classify yourself as having generalized anxiety disorder? Um, the answer would be no, because you know where it's coming from. So generalized anxiety disorder is pretty much you're just worried about all kinds of things. It's not really one thing that's making you worried. Uh, if we know it's from school, then it's not generalized anxiety. It's because we know school caused it, right? So people with generalized anxiety worry about all kinds of things that go into it. Going to the grocery store, they'll have worries about the car crashing, or if their parents went to the grocery store, they'll worry about something bad happening. Um, they like every little plan they make uh, can have severe anxiety with them. So just worrying about all kinds of disaster situations would be a form of generalized anxiety. Yeah, so the whole idea is just not a specific thing. So if someone's listing off all kinds of things they're worried about, school, work, relationships, um, whatever you can think of games people thinking about them all that so if there's a long list um they probably have generalized anxiety so with panic disorders we talk about a panic attack so panic disorder is when you have a panic attack and you have a fear of having future panic attacks to the point that you basically isolate yourself so that you don't have another panic attack so you're just worried about like this caused the panic attack uh, when i went to the liquor store so i'm not going to go to that liquor store anymore um, this caused a panic attack, so I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to interact with that person anymore. And then you basically start to isolate yourself and have less and less things. Um, your behavior becomes very routine so that you avoid having uh, a panic attack in the future. Um, usually it comes with a lot of panic attacks. So people who have anxiety can also suffer from like tons of panic attacks, um, but they don't necessarily develop a panic disorder. So you can have panic attacks often without having the fear of having a future panic attack with a panic disorder. Um, but if you do have the panic disorder, the fear of having a future panic attack can actually trigger the panic attack. So it's like a no-win situation. All right. So um, these are all the different symptoms with a panic attack. So lots of uh, different symptoms here. Um, usually I ask my students if anybody's had a panic attack, would like to talk about it. Uh, doesn't really work right here. So I'll tell you guys about my panic attack and it's not even something I think that's all too serious. Um, I had one panic attack um, when I was in high school, when I think I was like 16 or 17 at a time. Um, and I've just failed my driving license twice. So in California, you can take uh, the driving test three times if under the age of 18. If you fail all three times, you have to wait until you're 18. So here I am, uh, like about 16, 17, with my car that I uh, basically guilt tripped at my dad into buying for me. Um, and it's just sitting there, and I'm just like, man, if I fail this again, like this car would be sitting there for like a year because I can't drive it because I don't have a driver's license. So I'm hanging out with my friend, um, and all of a sudden, I just started having a panic attack. I could feel like I, the shortness of breath was something that was true. Uh, I felt like I couldn't breathe, so that was a big thing. And, um, I don't think uh, feeling chunky, not really, just the shortness of breath, um, feeling dizzy, a little bit lightheaded or faint, and very hot, like I was feeling like really hot. Um, numbness, yeah, uh, derealization was there, or depersonalization. Um, basically, I ended up <clears throat> laying on the floor because it was hot, uh, and it was a concrete floor. Um, and then the fear of losing control, just feeling like you're going crazy makes a lot of sense because you're just like, things are not right. Your mind just goes into this red alert mode and it's just like sirens are blaring in your head and you're like, things are not right. Things are just wild. Your brain's just losing it. And then this fear of dying because you can't breathe. So I'm just there like having this panic attack. I'm just like, things are not right. Everything's not right. And I have no control over anything. And my friend's asking me like, hey man, are you all right? I'm like, no. Nope. That's all I could tell him. I was like, no, I'm not all right. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm not okay. And I just like laid down on the ground. It's like, and he just kind of looked at me and he was just like, okay. Uh, he could tell something was on, going on, but I couldn't really vocalize to him what was happening. I just felt like hot. You know, it's like, I can't breathe. That's what I was like, I can't breathe and things are not all right. And I just kind of laid there for a while on the ground. Um, the cold ground helped because again, I was feeling like really hot. And I was convincing myself like I was breathing, but I could not feel air get in there. 
um yeah so i was just like hyperventilating and i was like look you're breathing you could see your physical body breathing in and out and so i don't know how long it lasted um usually panic attacks last uh from like a couple of minutes to like 10 or 15 minutes so they could be very long um but they don't go on forever so 15 minutes is about kind of like how the maximum they feel um but after that i was able to get back up and i was like man i, I think i just had a panic attack <laughs> like and he was like yeah <laughs> and i was like all right and then we just went back uh to doing whatever it was we were doing I didn't really talk about it because you know that's how guys are uh yeah not very emotional but so what should you do um, when someone's going through and having uh, pretty much a panic attack episode, right? So uh, they won't be able to really tell you much about what's going on. Uh, they probably can say like they can't breathe or if you ask them if they're okay, they'll say no. Um, sometimes they, people do have panic attacks where they uh, get violent or run around. And, uh, but most of the time it's just like they really shut down um, and uh, faint possibly as well. So. Um, if someone is having a panic attack, you should give them lots of room. Um, you should be there with them because they do have that fear of dying and fear of losing control. Uh, so just being there with them, just kind of sitting with them um, will really help. But not like having 10 people around them. It's like, hey, are you okay? Because you're just basically sucking away all the oxygen. Um, so just give them some space and just kind of be there. Uh, have water, see what they need. And eventually they, they just go through the cycle. It's almost like your body triggers this reaction. Um, then you have to just, just have to wait it out and you go through the cycle and then you're back to normal. I've had a student who um, basically has really high anxiety and she was like, I've had a panic attack for like an hour and I was like, that's not right because usually it only lasts for 15 minutes. So what she was basically going through was having um, several panic attacks. So she was having one panic attack and then she'll recover and then she'll feel like normal and she'll be functional, but she'll be really anxious. Um, and that high anxiety sustains itself for a while. And then she hits another panic attack because of all the anxiety that's building up. So it might be that she's afraid of having the next panic attack or she's just really anxious. Um, so her body cycles through um, being having a panic attack, recovering, being really highly anxious, and then having another panic attack and kind of cycling through that for like an hour or more to find she's able to calm down. So in those cases, um, I think medication is really appropriate um, because your body's just kind of, um, your biological reaction is just kind of too high. All right, uh, so panic disorders, I kind of mentioned that already, um, but if you, basically the fear of having a future panic attack, um, yeah, and yeah, most people, 22% of the U.S. population will have a panic attack, so one in five. Um, there's other video clips that you guys want to uh, basically click on that and listen to other stories of what a panic attack feels like. Um, and basically, you go through all these symptoms for a while, like uh, as I mentioned, five to 15 minutes of shutdown. All right. So um, agoraphobia, we are on to specific types of phobia. So um, you can have different types of phobias. So agoraphobia is a big one, and it's a fear about um, public spaces. So the fear comes from not being able to escape from a public place. So these people tend to stay at home a lot um, because whenever they go outside, they start having a rise in anxiety um, um, because it's a public space. and just a fear of not being able to escape from that public space. So they will avoid public transportation, open spaces, uh, being in enclosed spaces like theaters, um, standing in line or being in a crowd, being outside the home, etc. <coughs> so I had a student, um, I wasn't sure if it was um, agoraphobia or PTSD. And sometimes this is the, the difficulty of diagnosis is that what really is the correct diagnosis, right? So this student um, served in the Iraq war. Um, and so now he's afraid of going to the mall. The mall is a public space, right? So you may be thinking agoraphobia, right? But his fear of public spaces comes from the war itself, like public spaces with lots of people were targets for suicide bombers. So the reason why he doesn't go to public spaces um, is because of the anxiety. He feels there's a lot of 
um, anxiety in public spaces. You don't know where danger is coming from. You know, he's always on like higher alert because it's public spaces. A lot of people, you don't know who to kind of like watch out for. Everyone becomes a suspect. Um, so it could be PTSD. It could be PTSD and agoraphobia because sometimes anxiety disorders kind of change and evolve. Um, so again, I'm not like a psychiatrist, but he would be one of those two. Um, but he probably has other disorders as a result from the PTSD. He might have had anxiety already, like high anxiety, and that could lead him to have PTSD and then subsequent different types of disorders. Um, I think this one's really interesting to watch. Uh, I believe it's about the pickle girl. Um, if you guys, I'll leave you guys with this because uh, watch the pickle girl um, and see what her reaction to her fear of pickles is. Um, yeah, so watch the pickle girl, and we'll re revisit that at our next lecture. Um, but other types of fears: fear of heights, acrophobia, fear of flying. Some people have a fear of flying, um, but you have to consider: are they afraid of flying because of the fear of flying itself, like airplanes crash, or fear of airplanes crashing, or are they afraid of uh, small spaces? I don't know what's going on with my screen. Um, but claustrophobia would be another fear. So some people have a fear of flying is because of the tight space that, that their airline or the airplane is. So it's not a fear of flying, it's a fear of the enclosed space. So they would have difficulties in like buses and tunnels, um, closets, anything that's a really small space, um, that would be claustrophobia. You can have fear of dogs, fear of blood, fear, uh, fear of snakes, um, fear of being alive, fear of injections, and even fear of strangers. So there's a long list of phobias that you can have. If there's a fear you have, there's probably a phobia for it. Um, so watch the pickle girl, um, and then you kind of figure out like what's the difference between being afraid of something and having a phobia of something. So if your reaction is similar to the pickle girl, and um, the reaction is basically uh, in exaggeration with the real fear. So it's really an exaggerated response to a fear. Like spiders mostly can't kill you, but if you're like burning down the house because there's a spider in the house, that's an exaggerated response. So then we'll consider that a phobia rather than just a fear of spiders. So yeah, it depends on how severely you react uh, when something scares you. So again, watch the pickle girl, um, and then I'll start off the next lecture talking about uh, what her reaction is. All right, so I'll see you guys uh, next Wednesday, same time, um, and then I'll probably upload um, a different link on YouTube next week about all these videos that are going on there. So stay healthy, guys.